Dot Talks in collaboration with the Department of Political Science brings you an online lecture series titled The Relevance and Significance of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Today and Tomorrow. In continuation with the lecture series, we have a very wonderful person with us, an expert uh, professor, Dr. Scout, Dr. Scott R. Strout from Department of uh, Communication Studies, University of Texas, Austin, Program Director for Media Ethics, Center for Media Engagement. Dr. Scott R. Stroud is an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He writes on various topics in ethics, rhetoric, and philosophy. He is the author of two academic books, John Davy and the Artful Life and Kant and the Promise of Rhetoric. He is the co-founder of the first center uh, for John Davy Studies in India at Savitribai Phule Pune University. Currently, uh, Dr. Stroud is completing a book manuscript that tells us the story of Dr. Ambedkar's brush with Davian pragmatism at Columbia University during 1913 to 1916 and how it shaped his innovative pursuit of social justice in India. Uh, Professor Stroud is going to be our fifth speaker in the lecture series. So I, Dr. Anirudha Babar from Department of Political Science and also the coordinator of Doc Talks, I welcome Dr. Stroud and uh, request Dr. Stroud to please kindly uh, begin his lecture. Uh, Professor, uh, this virtual stage is all yours. We are really eager to listen to you. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Babar. And uh, thank you, Tetso College, for having me talk about my research on John Dewey and Baba Sahib. Uh, the project is very exciting, and I think it is an exciting project for both India and for America, because they're both struggling with the idea of how to make democracy work in an age of misinformation, heated partisan feelings, uh, groups and political parties that do not like each other. So, you know, in many ways, the challenge of democracy is the same for both these countries, how to get along with people who don't automatically like you. Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about the historical roots of my answer to this question in the philosophies of Dr. Ambedkar and Dr. Dewey. Uh, so I, I have some slides here because oftentimes uh, pictures are more exciting than, uh, you know, my own uh, verbosity. So let me share my screen and uh, I assume this will work. Let's see. And in a second, you should see a PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, and uh, so my topic today is on Bimrao Bedkar, John Dewey, and the challenges of social democracy. And uh, you know, like I said, this is an exciting topic, and it's an exciting topic for a variety of reasons. One is anyone who studies Dr. Ambedkar knows that there are these tantalizing clues in his corpus of thought uh, to John Dewey, his professor at Columbia University. So for instance, in 1952, he writes Savita Ambedkar, uh, upon learning the, on the, the death of Don, John Dewey, uh, that you know he was looking forward to meeting him when Dr. Ambedkar got back to New York in 1952 because he owes all his intellectual life to him. Uh, yet he doesn't spell out what this debt is, and uh, we know Dr. Ambedkar did not mince words. So, you know, what what exactly did he get or learn or take or appropriate from John Dewey and John Dewey's pragmatism? In 1936, we probably all come across this line in the Annihilation of Caste text, the undelivered speech Dr. Ambedkar wrote. Uh, you know, he has a line where he explicitly quotes Professor Dewey, who is my teacher and to whom I owe so much. So all these things have led me to the question, what does uh, Dr. Ambedkar get from John Dewey's philosophy? Obviously, it's not the same. These are two different great thinkers. But there was a relationship, an intellectual relationship between these two. So how do we spell this out? That's one of the goals I'm working on in my current book. And the second question, which always intrigues me, uh, being a, an American where religion in some ways plays an important role in politics and in other ways doesn't play much of a role in politics, you have the question of Ambedkar's Buddhism. You know, so there the question could be something like this. What unique role does Buddhism play in Dr. Ambedkar's notion of democracy? Now, this question has led me, and this book that I'm currently finishing up has led me to India many times in search of every scrap of paper I could find where Baba Sahib has underlined something, uh, annotated his own books, uh, or written out draft manuscripts or notebooks. And so this has been a wonderful quest to get into the mind, as expansive as it is, 
of Dr. Baba Sahib and Bedkar. And so I've met a variety of wonderful people who have helped me in so many ways, sharing their knowledge, uh, sharing access to these documents, or just showing me around some of the sites that I only have read about in Dr. Ambedkar's life. Uh, so let's get to the larger question here. Some folks out there may not know much about pragmatism. Now, in America, a lot of people have heard of this term. It's associated with a tradition of thought that got initiated in American circles after the American Civil War. And some of the main figures, but not the only figures of it, are Charles Sand Sanders Peirce, William James, and John Dewey. These are very important thinkers in a variety of fields. James and Dewey, for instance, uh, you know, touched many fields from education to psychology to philosophy. Jane Addams inspired and influenced John Dewey on uh, conflict resolution and, and ideas of peace. So uh, it's this wonderful group of thinkers that were all different, but they all had a commitment to pluralism. And that's another question you can ask. What makes someone a pragmatist? Part of it is the historical lineage. You were in conversation with, even if you did not agree with, certain people. Uh, but you can also think of it in terms of doctrines. So let's start zooming in, focusing in on John Dewey. And we see that John Dewey, if you wanted to give the largest scale view of his philosophy, you could say he was committed to these four things. One, that democracy matters. We'll talk more about democracy in a second with both Dewey and Embedkar's notion of social democracy. Two, science is a useful tool. All of the pragmatists were convinced that science and the revolutions wrought by Darwin were essential for human thought and the liberal arts, not to mention technological science. Three, community assumed a valuable role. And this is related to the idea of democracy, but it's also related to science because how does science progress? It's through community or group inquiry. And then fourth, and not unrelated to the previous three themes, is education. Dewey was known as the philosopher of education, and there's no, you know, it's not a mistake that he was known as this. He penned many important works that were formative with experiential education and education in the 20th century. So John Dewey uh, loved these themes. They were all interrelated, and they come out in various ways through his 8 million words that he penned over the course of his lifetime. Now let's start talking about one specific topic here that will then we'll follow this thread out in Dr. Ambedkar's thought. Let's ask the simple question, what is democracy? What is democracy for someone like John Dewey or for pragmatists in general? Is it simply a decision-making procedure? Everyone votes, everyone's vote counts for one. You know, is that the idea of democracy? That's uh, you know, typically what we think of in America when we think of democracy. Uh, you know, we, we, the access to the vote or making sure the vote is legitimate or uh, th these are kind of questions of the, the democratic structure of political life. Who's in Washington, D.C. representing people? So th these are questions of democracy as a voting procedure where either the people make the decision or the people that the people elect make the decisions. But notice that these are very periodical notions, periodic notions of democracy. Uh, democracy only happens when you take a vote. Now, that's not wrong, but from the perspective of someone like John Dewey, as early as 1888, when John Dewey was just a young assistant professor in Michigan, uh, he started to question and criticize this notion of democracy. Again, he didn't dispute that voting was a valuable procedure, but he did dispute the idea that that's all that democracy meant. So in 1888, in a text which I have evidence influenced Dr. Ambedkar through his whole life, uh, you know, Dewey pins these words. Democracy in a word is a social, that is to say an ethical conception, and upon its ethical significance is based its significance as governmental. Democracy is a form of government only because it is a form of moral and spiritual association. This theme doesn't leave Dewey in 1916 in a very important book, both for American educational reform and for Dr. Ambedkar, uh, Democracy and Education. Uh, Dewey writes these famous words, a democracy is more than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. So democracy is a habit. It's a habit of how we interact, a habit of how we communicate with other people. 
These underlines, by the way, are from Dr. Embedkar's copy, one of his copies. He owned about five copies of Democracy and Education. You see in the bottom corner of my slide, that's his original notation uh, indicating where he got that copy in 1917, January in London, after he got through with his classroom experience with John Dewey. Later on in Dewey's life, in an essay which turns into a chapter called Creative Democracy, The Task Before Us, uh, another essay I have evidence that Dr. Embedkar had access to and was influenced by, John Dewey changes the way he says this, but he's getting at the same point. Democracy is a way of life, says John Dewey. And only as we realize and thought and act that democracy is a personal way of individual life, that it signifies the possession and continual use of certain attitudes forming personal character and determining desire and purpose in all the relations of life. So you start to get this expansive view of democracy from John Dewey uh, that, you know, that plays out through his whole life, where democracy is about our social interactions as much as or more so than just our political decision-making procedures. Now let's zoom back to 1913 at Columbia University. This is the time period in Dr. Embedkar's life where he first became exposed to many wonderful progressive thinkers in the United States academic system. Columbia was a hotbed of, of sharp thinkers that were redefining their fields. One of those thinkers was John Dewey. And that's who we will spend a lot of time on talking today. That doesn't mean that other thinkers didn't influence Dr. Embedkar. Uh, of course, a lot of people influenced Dr. Embedkar, but the challenge always is, is how did someone influence Dr. Embedkar? So today I will spend the next 30 minutes explaining to you, uh, you know, from my research, how Dr. John Dewey influenced Bimram Bedkar and others are very welcome to spell out the stories that lie behind his other teachers. So the questions that can guide us in thinking about Dr. Bedkar's experience at Columbia University and in the subsequent years where he remained in contact with the ideas of John Dewey are these. What did Bedkar learn from John Dewey? And two, what creative additions did Embedkar make as an Indian pragmatist? That's one thing I want to emphasize to my American colleagues who often talk about the range of people that are part of the pragmatist tradition, ranging from John Dewey to Jane Addams to Mary Simkovich, all the way over to China, who sure, a student of Dewey's right after Embedkar's time at Columbia. Uh, there's a range of people that are influenced by or reacting to the pragmatist tradition, not simply echoing it, of course. And I want to say that Embedkar is another figure we should put into this pantheon of pragmatist thinkers and all of its diversity. And Embedkar is going to obviously have a very unique philosophy that adds to what we know of pragmatism's capabilities. But again, let's think about Columbia University. What do we know about Embedkar at Columbia University? We know he studied there 1913 to 1916. Uh, from his transcripts, uh, you can find in the archives in Mumbai and elsewhere, you know he took a bunch of classes, over 50, in so many subjects. And three of those classes were classes you can trace to the instructorship of John Dewey. Uh, one is Philosophy 231, Psychological Ethics and Moral and Political Philosophy, and that was in fall of 1914. A second one was Philosophy 131 to 132, Moral and Political Philosophy, and that was 1915 to 1916. That was a whole year-long course. There is no evidence that Embedkar, while he was at Columbia, took any classes on education from John Dewey. We know he got democracy in education after he was done with classes at Columbia University. So uh, you know, we start to see what he had in terms of exposure. Now we'll dive into these, but let's organize our inquiry. Let's think about this in three ways or three key themes to Embedkar's pragmatism. And Embedkar's pragmatism is different from that of John Dewey's. It's different from that of William James. It's different from that of Peirce or Jane Addams, et cetera. Uh, so you know, to give it a new title, I, I have started to use in my own work the idea of Navayana pragmatism, because in many ways Embedkar uses some themes from John Dewey and supplements it with other themes and other concerns and other problematics. And he makes this new type of philosophy, just as he did in Buddhism, with Navayana Buddhism, as it's called. So let's talk about three key concepts in Embedkar's Navayana pragmatism. One, cast as a habit. Two, force as paradoxical and three, religion as a means to social change. First, cast as habit. In that philosophy 231 course, Psychological Ethics, 
Uh, I found the notes for this, the lecture notes and student notes. And so you can see what John Dewey was telling the students in his classes. And it, you know, it's quite fascinating. He's talking to them about the ethics that John Dewey subscribed to at that time in 1915. Uh, you know, and and it, it has some terms that you see throughout the latter Dewey's thought, such as the place of intelligence and behavior, not correctness, not the goodwill, but the idea of intelligent adaptation to social conditions. And it really foregrounds the role of attitude or habit. This class is about the individual psychological standpoint. So Dewey maintains a laser focus on the idea of the attitudes or habits of individuals. Individuals as part of a community, of course, but how, how much these matter and how much these can change. This is a theme that Embedkar also saw in William James. I've held the copy of William James's Principles of Psychology that Baba Sahib owned. And so we obviously knew about James's wonderful reading of habit, being a guide to our life and something that we can change or optimize. So at any rate, if you start looking in the 1930s and you know what to look for, you start to see echoes of this kind of psychology of habit and individual attitude. In Annihilation of Caste, Baba Sahib famously says, caste is a notion, it's a state of mind. And any reform of this will be a notional change. So something about changing the ideas in people's heads, not simply changing laws, or banning something like caste. That's important, of course, but that doesn't get rid of the actual cause of this problem, which is uh, many people rank each other by caste birth. So if you look again at another part of Annihilation of Caste, you see this wonderful passage where Embedkar says, all reform consists in a change in the notions, sentiments, and mental attitudes of the people towards men and things. And he says, it's common experience that certain names or labels or concepts become associated with certain notions and sentiments. And what does he say there? Well, he says something that John Dewey wouldn't have read into his ethics, which is the idea of caste and caste labels, making certain people feel honored and bringing a vomiting sensation when other caste labels are mentioned to, into someone's mouth. So, so his idea here is simple, right? That the caste structures what we see and what kind of value and meaning we give to the objects in front of us. So this is Dewey in psychology, but it's Dewey in psychology with a ameliorative twist. He's looking for the attitudes that drive the caste system. John Dewey, of course, wasn't concerned about the caste system, and so his ethics kind of go a different path. Both Ambedkar and Dewey, however, subscribe heavily to the idea of reflection. You know, their idea was not that people need one answer for moral problems or know the right moral book, but it's that they develop the right habits of inquiry or reflection, as Dewey puts it, in this period of his life. Uh, and so you see this echoed, this kind of value of the skill of inquiry, echoed in Baba Sahib's Annihilation of Caste. And you see this passage that I've put on the slide, reflective thought, Embedkar writes, in the sense of active, persistent, careful consideration of any belief or supposed form or knowledge in the lights of the grounds that support it and further conclusions to which it tends is quite rare and arises only in a situation which presents a crisis or a dilemma. What Embedkar is doing here is taking Dewey's very well-known notion of a problematic situation where certain habits or certain expectations or certain attitudes lead you to a jarring of experience. And then reflection comes in to solve the, the problem and to perhaps re reaffirm the habits, ameliorate or correct the habits, or optimize the habits. Uh, so this is Dewey's idea of how you can constantly grow to meet situations how education can lead you to be a reflective individual. So Embedkar takes this idea of reflection and he starts to apply it in areas that John Dewey would have never thought about, such as the battle against caste and caste attitudes. Now let's move to the second theme, that is force and the idea of social democracy. In that second course or series of courses really, a one year series of course uh, in 1915 to 1916, Embedkar sits in a classroom with John Dewey for a whole year. And there he learned some valuable things. Now, up until about a year or so ago, uh, I don't think anyone could have told us what happened in that classroom. I've been able to find the other students who took notes in these classrooms, and, and I confirm that Ambedkar was among them. How do you know this? Well, look at a couple of the pages. I've circled one here, uh, and you see that the notes are indicated as from a substitute note taker, and it says Ambedkar. 
So you know for a fact that this series of notes over the course of a whole year of two courses, uh, you know, was to students, one of which was Dr. Embedkar. And so you can see a day-by-day -day recounting of all of these lectures. And what you see are a range of themes, some of which don't matter a bit to Dr. Embedkar. And some of them make sense of what Dr. Embedkar does later in his life. So I want to highlight two of those to you. One, he, you know, Dr. Dewey brings up in the class uh, the idea of forces energy, forces violence. We'll see that in a second with Embedkar's evolving thought in the 1910s. But Dewey also brings up, in kind of a passing reference, the idea of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, we all know that these are three terms that become of very valuable use for Embedkar in his you know, pursuit of social justice. So for instance, in the constitution he is the architect of in the 1940s, you see these three values appear in the preamble. Uh, you also see these three values, liberty, equality, fraternity, appear in the Buddha and his Dhamma, a book that gets published shortly after Dr. Embedkar's death that he wrote in the 1950s quite furiously. And then you also see them in 1949 when he gives a speech on the hopes of democracy in India. And he says, you know, he says, what does social democracy mean? And his answer draws upon these three concepts, a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles, and not just one of them above others, but all three of them. Now, it's important to note that if you read quite a bit of John Dewey's philosophy, uh, you won't see these three values that much. These are not touchstones for Dewey. And so it's, it's one of these vicissitudes of fate where John Dewey brings these three things up in an April lecture in uh, his class in 1916. And then he, you know, Dewey largely leaves them behind, but Embedkar sees these things and starts using them in new and creative ways to flesh out the idea of social democracy. So uh, let, let's summarize social democracy before we move on. If you want to say what Embedkar's Navayana pragmatism is dedicated to in terms of social democracy, uh, this is how I would put it. One, it's dedicated to these three values, achieving these three values in group life, and not just achieving the presence of each of these, but a balance among them. And that balance is what he denotes as justice. So it's not simply equality and achieving equality that means a state of justice. If there is no equality, there is no justice, but you need justice, uh, equality among these other two values to truly have justice. That, I believe, is Embedkar's kind of uh, flexible pragmatist view of what justice is. It also, social democracy, concerns individuals, the habits we have and how we talk to other people on Facebook, on Twitter, or on the, the street corner, and communities, because our communities influence what we think of ourselves and what we think of other people. He also believes that social democracy doesn't just necessitate people who follow leaders or are trained in certain ways, but are trained to think in certain ways. So I think that's why we could say that he needs reflective individuals in these communities. Now let's go to theme two, force and reform, or the other aspect of theme two, really. Uh, and in 1918, Embedkar reviews Bertrand Russell, a British philosopher's book, Principles of Social Reconstruction. In 19, that's a 1916 book. Now this is a fascinating work. And Bedkar's review because it's one of the few book reviews he did. I think it's the only book review he's ever did so done in his career. So uh, there's a real question on why he did this and what importance it is. I think it's a very, very important work and it's an early work. He just got through with his education in Columbia and London and then returned to India. So in that book that he's reviewing, Bertrand Russell has a fascinating view on conflict. Uh, so you look at this passage I've highlighted for you, where Russell is kind of skeptical, and he's skeptical because of what's happening in World War I, the Great War, where everyone said the other side is awful, let's kill them, or let's defeat them. And Russell quite honestly says each side always believes that it deserves to triumph, but when they gain power, when the oppressed win freedom, they are as oppressive as their former masters. So Russell had this kind of interesting dialectical view of how the oppressed can quite easily become the oppressor. And uh, you know, I'm sure Embedkar, he read this, and he, this was part of his review, this idea of how do you achieve justice, or how do you have a reform of society that doesn't create more problems than it solves? Now, what's interesting from the notion of social democracy and pragmatism here 
is that this book review in 1918 is the first case of where Ambedkar refers to the ideas and language of Professor Dewey explicitly. Now in this book review, Ambedkar says he's concerned with Indian readers reading in Bertrand Russell's book, Quietism as the Best Path. And he refers to John Dewey and Dewey's distinction on force is violence or force is energy. And for Ambedkar as well as for Dewey, the first one is bad. Force is violence is bad, but force is energy is a necessity. So Ambedkar along with Dewey think that people like Tolstoy or Gandhi are slightly misled in, you know, in thinking that you just need to get rid of all force. Uh, you need some kind of effective means to achieve change. Uh, what is wrong with violence is not that it's forceful, uh, but that it destroys too many ends. So for instance, if you look at those lectures that John Dewey was giving that Young and Bedkar was hearing as an audience member, as a student, he says this, Dewey says this, in the case of force, which is a means, you have words which make a distinction, energy and violence. Energy is the ability to work. Violence connotes destructive power or force. And then interestingly enough, Dewey starts criticizing uh, the view that wants to get rid of all force as the policy of passive inaction. And he, he then makes some vague references to nirvana. So you can imagine young Ambedkar, uh, interested as he might be in Buddhism from an early age, uh, hearing this kind of reference of nirvana as a passive inaction. And of course, if we know anything about Baba Sahib's philosophy, it's that Buddhism is a socially engaged, forceful way of achieving social democracy. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so at any rate, you start to see from this early book review, the challenge for Dr. Ambedkar's Naviana pragmatism from 1918 onwards is simple, but complex. How do you achieve social democracy? You know, how, what are the means, what are the forces you can employ while not destroying the balance among equality, liberty, and fraternity? That's a deceptively simple question because it is a very difficult balancing act for social democracy. Now let's go to theme three, the final theme. And that is where we talk about Navayana Buddhism and Bedkar's form of Buddhism as an intelligent means of democratic reform. In other words, Buddhism as a way to achieve social democracy. Now, we all know that Dr. Ambedkar penned in the last few years of his life, uh, a wonderful gift to humanity. That is his vision of the gospel of the Buddha. That's the Buddha and his Dhamma. The early edition, the early draft was literally called the Buddha and his gospel in 1951. In the second edition, right, or the, the edition that's eventually published, the Buddha and his Dhamma, uh, we see a new section. Book four is totally new. And in that section, you have a new edition, a new reading of Ahimsa, nonviolence. Uh, so this is part of the fascinating pragmatic evolution of Baba Sahib's thought. And I can only touch on some parts of it. Uh, but let's look at that section real quick. Uh, and you see there, he, he starts talking about Ahimsa in an interesting way. He says, well, the question is, has the Buddha's Ahimsa, was, is it absolute in its obligation or only relative? Is it a principle or was it a rule? Now, if you are like me and you read a lot of John Dewey, this has a certain meaning to you because John Dewey had a very well-known distinction in his moral philosophy between principle and rule. Uh, but first, you know, don't make any mistake, this reading of Ahimsa was very controversial at the time. In uh, 1959, I believe, this is a, a copy of one of the early reviews of the Buddha's Dhamma, and it's quite negative. Uh, you know, he says, uh, the reviewer says, and Bedkar becomes positively dangerous and that the reading of Ahimsa is mealy-mouthed and it reads as an incitement to acts of violence. I believe that this reviewer did not quite understand the distinctions and limits that Ambedkar was working with when, in rereading Ahimsa, but nonetheless, it's a controversial rereading. So if you look at John Dewey on principle and rule, you start to see what Ambedkar was getting at. John Dewey wrote a famous book in 1908 called The Ethics. Now, this is why I think it's important to pay attention to what exactly we are saying Ambedkar was exposed to with John Dewey. Because Ambedkar did not read the second edition of Dewey and Tuft's book, Ethics, in 1932, which is a radically different version of Dewey's moral philosophy. What Ambedkar had access to, what he quoted, what he echoed, what he drew from, was the 1908 edition. And I found at Siddharth College he had at least two copies of this 1908 edition. Uh, and in that edition, you see the same part, I've circled it here on my pictures, uh, the same passage 
annotated by Dr. Ambedkar in the margins, and that's Dewey and Tuft's distinction between rules and principles. Here's a bigger version of that passage. You know, and, and this is also a line that appears in Annihilation of Caste, Ambedkar's text. Rules are practical, they're habitual ways of doing things, but principles are intellectual. They are useful methods of judging things. In other words, principles are useful habits of reflection. They're not just simply habits of reaction. Okay, so back to the Buddha and his Dhamma. And then we start to make more sense of what Ambedkar is doing with his Buddhism. If we, if we have this kind of idea of rules are, 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 you know, they tell you exactly what to do, but they're not flexible. They're not adaptive. They're not encouraging of reflection in problematic situations. So look back at Buddha and his Dhamma and you see this passage in that newly added book four. Uh, Buddha, Ambedkar says, said, love all so that you may not wish to kill any. And this, Ambedkar says, is a positive way of stating the principle of ahimsa. From this, it appears that the doctrine of ahimsa does not say kill not. It says love all. So Ambedkar starts to turn ahimsa from non-harm into a principle of loving all. And he comes back at the end of the section to bring it back to this kind of conceptual distinction from Dewey, which in Dewey's mind had nothing to do with ahimsa. Uh, so to put it differently, Ambedkar writes in the Buddha and his Dhamma, the Buddha made a distinction between principle and rule. He did not make ahimsa a matter of rule. He enunciated it as a matter of principle or a way of life. And then Ambedkar says this wonderful phrase at the end, a principle leaves you freedom to act. A rule does not. A rule either breaks you or you, it break, or you break the rule. You know, so the idea here is very clear, and it's a very pragmatist idea, which is the guidelines to thinking in the future need to be flexible because the future is not always like the past. And so ahimsa as a blunt rule of don't harm becomes too limiting for a social reformer like Ambedkar, although Ambedkar clearly doesn't want to encourage violence in many, many occasions. We'll see that in a second. So Navayana Buddhism, by emphasizing tools such as ahimsa, becomes a religion of principle, a religion of principle that he wanted in the annihilation of caste. And it's going to be that way to reconstruct your habits of communication and others' habits of communication such that you can achieve equality, liberty, and fraternity. And so Buddhism starts to put more emphasis in Ambedkar's reading on the forces of persuasion and not simply on violence or very forcefully changing other people to be what you want them to be uh, when it comes to social democracy. So now you look back to the 1950s and the final years of Ambedkar's life. He pens a few works very furiously trying to get them finished before he, his end. He knew he was not having many more years left. And one of those works was a enigmatic 30 some page, uh, you know, beginning of a book really called Buddha or Karl Marx. So think this is not the speech by the same title, but think of the, the manuscript by that. And in that manuscript, he has referred once again to Professor Dewey explicitly. And once again, he refers to Dewey's distinction from those lectures in 1916 on force, ends, means, violence, and energy. And so we see he wraps the thought of Dewey back into this Buddhist vocabulary and starts asking these questions. Buddha would have probably admitted that it is only the end which would justify the means very similar to Professor Dewey's way of cutting it up, of course. What else could Ambedkar continues? He would have said that if the end justified violence, violence was a legitimate means for the end in view. So what he's trying to do here is not to read Buddha as you know, pro-violence, but the idea of self-defense is not categorically excluded. Uh, and more importantly, Ambedkar wants to emphasize the idea that these rules distract us. They distract us from the challenges of social democracy. And if you read on in that book, you start to see more references to Professor Dewey. And Bedkar says, Dewey has pointed out that violence is only another name for the use of force. And although force must be used for creative purposes, a distinction between the use of force as energy and use of force as violence needs to be made. The achievement of an end involves the destruction of many other ends, which are integral with the one that is sought to be destroyed. So the important thing for Ambedkar's pragmatism in the 1950s, and you see this in the second passage, uh, is that the use of force may be so regulated that it should save as many ends as possible in destroying the evil one. So uh, what he's getting at here is not, Buddha was not against all use of force, not all use of violence, 
but he, he was particularly against those uses of force that we label as violence that eliminate too many ends in pursuit of one end in a fanatical fashion. And this is typically what happens with political revolutionaries or people that want to use violence to radically change a political scenario is that they're wiping away the values and the goals and the projects of too many other people in community. Uh, and they're just focusing on their achievement of what they believe is their end. So, uh, you know, to put this in a summary fashion, and Bedkar's pragmatism only says use force, uh, force is energy really, that is intelligent or constructive, that does not foreclose the present or future end of community with those you like and those you dislike. So in Bedkar as well as Dewey, we're very much on the same wavelength. They don't solve today's problems in a way that create new problems tomorrow. So think back to that essay on Buddha or Karl Marx that Embedkard penned in his last years. There he refers explicitly to the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution in Russia, and Embedkar praises some aspects of it. So it's, you know, it seems to want to produce equality. But then Embedkar says something vitally important, but it cannot be too much emphasized that in producing equality, society cannot afford to sacrifice fraternity or liberty. Equality will be of no value without fraternity or liberty. It seems that the three can only coexist if one follows the way of the Buddha. Communism can give one according to Ambedkar, but not all three. So you see that the idea here is simple, that certain ways of using force might seem effective in achieving freedom or getting you your liberty or getting you your equality, but they sacrifice something else. And that something else so often is fraternity. Uh, you know, and this is, you know, he says the communists uh, can kill certain people and solve their problems, but that definitely doesn't engender friends among the living people who oppose them. So, I mean, Embedkar was very, uh, you know, against uses of force uh, that tried to violently solve problems because they created new problems. People that hated you all the more, people that wanted to resist you in new ways tomorrow. So what does he say in this manuscript that's so important? He says, Buddha's way was different. His method was to change the mind of man, to alter his disposition so that whatever man does, he does voluntarily without the use of force or compulsion. And the way he did this was Dhamma and preaching. <clears throat> so you see that, you know, basically Buddha was important because he was a persuader. He was a rhetor. He was an orator like Embedkar was in so much of his life. And this is what we do in democracy, Embedkar believes. You know, if you have problems, you try to solve them through communication. Uh, you can't solve everything, but you try to solve them. And you try not to resolve the problem in a way that creates new problems. And that's what violence does. So he concludes his passage, as I've highlighted, with this idea. The Buddha's way was to not force people to do what they did not like to do, although it was good for them. His way was to alter the disposition of men so they would do so voluntarily what they would not otherwise do. So you see in 1950s, in Embedkar's Navayana Buddhism, the kind of integration of this, this psychology that he saw parts of in John Dewey's class, the idea that the key battle for social reform so often is the mindsets and the habits of the people that make up societies and groups. So change the habits, change the group customs, change the social setting, achieve social democracy. So into the Buddha and his Dhamma once again, uh, we start to see hints of this, right? Something that uh, jars with some of our instincts as social reformers. Uh, you see, for instance, Embedkar uh, you know, said, cherish no anger, forget your enmities, win your enemies by love. That is the Buddha's way of life. And he also talks about the fire of anger should be stilled. Embedkar explicitly says, one who harbors the thought, he reviled me, maltreated me, overpowered me, robbed me, in him anger is never stilled. Uh, and so the idea is to still that anger. Enemy works enemy, evil to enemy, hater to hater. But whose is the evil? Let a man overcome anger by love. Let him overcome evil by good. So you get this fascinating new reading of force and persuasion as force and love as a forceful sort of persuasion in Embedkar's final years in Embedkar's Buddhism. So to start to wrap up, Buddhism and social democracy form an integrated pair in Embedkar's thought. Uh, social democracy, if it's about what I say it's about, which seems to be creating a community animated by shared interests and respectful individuals who all achieve their full potential, we get this kind of limit on our activities. We must not destroy existing communal bonds and create animosity in striving to create a community animated by respect and without animosity. So you cannot solve uh, unjust society by creating the conditions for future un un injustice in the future.
Okay, and so we must, in other words, maintain and nurture the basis of community and accept the limits to our will and power. I truly believe in Bedkar thought that you, you'd push hard like he did in his life for social democracy, but you might not achieve it. You might not achieve it. Why? Because as he said in the 1940s to his students at Siddharth College in a special lecture he gave on parliamentary democracy, he said you cannot, he said this to the students there, you cannot win over the minority or the opposition in houses of parliament, let's say, by giving your opponents a black eye. You know, and this is a very physical pugilistic metaphor, but the idea is simple, right? You know, you cannot destroy your opponents and hope to make community with your opponents. Uh, you know, this is the tactic of violence. This is the tactic of communists as he saw them. So the idea of social democracy is you need to pursue vigorously change and justice, but you must always remember the end goal. That is the creation of a community with those around you that has free flowing communication. So in summary, if you were to ask me the larger question, what is Ambedkar's pragmatist Navayana Buddhism about? and what are the kind of integrations it has with democracy and social democracy. Here's how I'd outline the picture. One, it's an obviously socially engaged philosophy. Suffering, dukkha, on Embedkar's reading becomes, in many cases, poverty or social disrespect uh, or disempowerment. Uh, two, it focuses on problematic habits or attitudes in self and also in others. Three, as a religion, Buddhism becomes a means to achieve social democracy. And there might be other means, of course, but Ambedkar thought this was a very good one. Why? Because it gave principles that guide our individual engagement with others in trying to achieve social reform. One of those principles, four, was ahimsa. And it became a principle of love for Ambedkar, not simply a rule that you just don't harm anything, microorganism or beyond. Uh, five, there must be hope. You must give hope in organizing, you must give hope in persuasion and advocacy, but you can't have any hope in violence or coercion on Embedkar's line of thinking. And I think that means at some point you recognize democracy is tragic. You know, you, you know what it could be to get equality, but you just can't get that right now. That's why Embedkar at the end of his life said he's not got many years to live, uh, but he's pushed the caravan forward and he hopes his followers push the caravan forward a bit more, or at least don't make it go backwards. And so I think this is the tragic in Embedkar, the idea that social democracy is an ideal. It's a very flexible ideal. It's a very useful ideal, but it's not an ideal we can expect to achieve tomorrow or next month. And sometimes democracy means knowing how to lose as well as knowing how to achieve victory and reform. So I will leave you with that in terms of the wonderfully complex notion of Embedkar's uh, social philosophy. But, uh, and I'll, you know, we, get, we have some discussion over it, but it, it's a wonderful uh, view of social democracy. It's a beautiful vista of, of what society could be. And I think it adds to what we think of the pragmatist lexicon from John Dewey and Peirce and James and Jane Addams and beyond. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I welcome questions and discussions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stroud, for this enlightening lecture. Uh, we learned a lot about the relationship between uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar as well as Professor John Dewey. But most importantly, we also understood uh, the various dimensions of uh, the Buddhism, uh, the democratic principles uh, of John Dewey, which inspired Dr. Ambedkar to construct uh, his philosophy. So uh, now, please, Professor, allow me to open this platform for the question and answer session. Uh, I, I open this platform. I request uh, the participants to, to share their thoughts, ideas, and also please do ask questions. We are willing to listen to you. Thank you. Uh, either you can uh, switch on your microphone or you can even uh, write your questions in the chat box. Okay, so before uh, a question comes, uh, Professor Stroud, uh, uh, you know, uh, I remember one of uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's quotes, right? He said that the best friends I have in life uh, were some of my classmates at Columbia and my great professors, John Dewey, James Shotwell, Edwin Seligman, and uh, James Harvey Robinson. I don't know, but I always remember this quote uh, whenever I teach my own students. 
I mean, the kind of uh, camaraderie and relationship that uh, Dr. Ambedkar has developed with uh, great minds in the history, like Professor Seligman and uh, Professor John Dewey, is really commendable. And uh, that, that my observation takes me uh, to, to believe that uh, the Protestant Buddhism that uh, Dr. Ambedkar is putting forth before us, I would love, would love to call it like a Protestant Buddhism. So this Navayana Buddhism, basically, uh, don't you think that uh, it could be a Devian Buddhism or Devian version of the Buddha, the social Buddha, which we have never thought of before? We, we speak about spirituality. We speak about salvation. Uh, we often speak about uh, Karuna, right? That is compassion. But here, the Buddha that Dr. B.R. Ambedkar has shown to us is a different Buddha. He's, he's a social reformer, right? So what is your take on it? I mean, it's re it's really lovely to observe that how uh, uh, Professor Davy has inspired young Ambedkar that he, you know, uh, 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 you know, inspired to develop a different structure altogether. How how do you see it, Professor? Over to you. Yes, it's an excellent question, uh, Professor Babar, and and really that's. I've figured out I can't include all the things I want to say about Ambedkar's Buddhism in my current book, which is too long. I got to cut it down before I send it back to the publisher. Uh, but I, so my next book is going to be on Ambedkar's Buddhism, but it's just a fascinating story. John Dewey knew very little about Buddhism. Uh, you know, and so his mentions were grossly off. You know, Nirvana is just a giving up of, of life and bliss and, and negation of yourself. And so so, you know, Dewey did not give Ambedkar one bit of, you know, of Buddha's thought. What I think Ambedkar saw in Dewey was this kind of pragmatist idea of religion as a means and religion as hopefully inculcating reflection in people versus just mere following. And then Ambedkar himself merged it with his own unique reading of Buddhism. So, like you're saying, you could think of Buddhism, Buddha, as a Deweyan figure, uh, but you know, do, I, I don't want to encourage people to think that Dewey gave Ambedkar the contents of Buddha and his Dhamma. He gave him conceptual distinctions like principle and rule. Uh, for instance, Dewey wrote a book in the 30s on Christianity and religion called A Common Faith, uh, where he basically tries to find a version of religion that's not otherworldly, but that engages us with this world. And that you know, would be a wonderful book for Embedkar to have read. I found no evidence that Embedkar had that book or read it. But you know, the, the ideas are still there kind of going in parallel. Dewey's looking for religion that's socially engaged. And Embedkar finds Buddhism and writes it with its emphases being on social engagement. So yeah, in, very, in, a, you know, in a way you could call it Protestant Buddhism. Uh, I like to call it you know, a, a pragmatist form of Buddhism. Other people will focus on other things, a socially engaged form of Buddhism. But at the end of the day, we're all talking about the same thing, which is this fascinating reading of Buddhism as an engaged philosophy of life, not as an otherworldly pursuit, uh, not as a focus on godlike figures, but as kind of a social philosophy with a different vocabulary that helps us, you know, envision the society we want to create. Uh, so it's a fascinating topic, I think. No, indeed, indeed. I mean, I, I do really agree with you. And uh, I also mean the same, that the principles which uh, John Davy has given to Dr. Ambedkar, I mean, as his professor, you know, uh, add, uh, adds up in his uh, intellect as a catalytic aspect, you know, and this is how it uh, flourish further. Uh, another aspect uh, that I would like to, I would like you to uh, share uh, your ideas on is about uh, uh, the, the democracy, you know, the Ambedkar's uh, vision of democracy. So basically, uh, his democratic uh, ideas and the principles are that of uh, social democracy. So he visualizes democracy as a form of a model, right? On one hand, he speaks about social Buddhism, right? Again, a, a greatest experiment in the history. Now he's talking about uh, the uh, social democracy, okay? And uh, it is also have been considered as a model. So uh, it is really wonderful to see that Dr. Ambedkar is working on two models. On one hand, uh, the model of the Buddhism, social Buddhism, and on the other hand, the model of democracy, the social democracy. Now, 
as a as a as a scholar of uh, Dr. Ambedkar's studies and thoughts, okay, how do you see whether these models are still relevant? To what extent they are relevant to solve the contemporary problems? Because you know we are sometimes we are trying to when we try to contextualize uh, uh, Professor Davy and Dr. Ambedkar in the modern perspective, right? We sometimes get stuck somewhere regarding considering the dynamic challenges that we are facing today, right? So, what is your take on it, considering the Buddhist model and the, uh, the social uh, democratic model? Will they be able to solve the problems of today, the problem that you and I are facing, you know, in the liberal democracy? I, you know, as much as any philosophy can solve a problem, they're wonderfully useful if we put them into practice and. Uh, this is what I, I try to tell my Western colleagues about Ambedkar. He is not just an Indian thinker, or as some people will say, oh, he was a Dalit thinker. No, he's he's a global thinker. He's a, he's a Indian thinker. He's also a global thinker. He's a philosopher. Like we still value Plato's thoughts. Well, you know, 100 years, 200 years from now, we're still going to value Dr. Ambedkar's thoughts. And so, and he knew this, I think. I think he knew that his message went beyond solving the awful caste problem in India. So for instance, he gave all these lectures in the 50s to what I call international audiences, people that were not oppressed by caste. Many of them were not even in India. You know, so he would go to these Buddhist conferences or he'd give you know, talks in Nepal or other neighboring countries. He'd give them in English. He would give these over BBC or Voice of America. Uh, you know, so he would give these lectures that were not you know, organized towards his uh, fellow Dalits who were oppressed. And he wouldn't talk about conversion. He would just talk about democracy and Buddhism and communism. So he really thought that you know this 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 was a global philosophy that was organized towards democracy and solving democracy's problems, whether it's caste, I believe, whether it's racism, or it's some new problem that we're going to discover a hundred years from now. And I think one of the most enduring themes, if you want to look at Embedkar, is a global thinker. You know, someone that's beyond any one historical period of India. Uh, you know, it's this idea of fraternity. Fraternity is part of the end you're seeking. You want, what does social democracy mean? It means a group of people that all get along together, that value each other, that respect each other, don't, that don't see people from this group or this race or this caste or this gender or this sexuality as lower than uh, another group. Uh, but it also, is a means. Fraternity is not just an end, it's also a means. It's part of the attitude we have towards others. And that's what I think he's getting at with all this love talk in his Buddha and his Dhamma. A book, remember, was authored in English. You know, So that's another thing that's fascinating. He intended Buddhism as a global faith. Uh, he wrote it in the language of the globe of the day, which was English. You know, He didn't write it first in Marathi or Hindi. He wrote it first in, in English. And so, uh, you know, he really thought beyond the problems he was trying to solve, problems he knew were important, but, you know, there's more after that. So, so he was looking at himself and his thought as hopefully a global philosophy or global approach. So that's one thing I try to emphasize. You can definitely focus on Embedkar as an anti-caste thinker, and that's incredibly valuable. But you can also think of him, of him as a general theorist of democracy. And what do I find very important in that kind of reading? It's this emphasis that you cannot solve problems of community in a way that destroy community in the future. You know, so you cannot solve things, problems of inequality, let's say, and sacrifice fraternity. So you have to find a way to solve inequality and maintain or enhance fraternity. So this is a fascinating new view on Embedkar, I believe. Uh, well, very true. And that is the reason when we read uh, the Buddha and the Karl Marx, we get to see his insight on, uh, you know, the communism as well. And as you rightly quoted what Dr. Ambedkar has uh, mentioned, that the violence is not a solution, right? So you cannot sacrifice the value of brotherhood. You cannot sacrifice the values of love and compassion to create an artificial equality, which, uh, 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 you know, the communism uh, propagates, you know. Uh, so, uh, so when you think about the communism or the communist ideals, we know that uh, you know this uh, the ideology which is based on uh, the the fractured uh, you know the concepts and the ideas you know uh, the class struggles and uh, uh, you know its culmination into oppression and the kind of solution which has been prescribed right. So when we read Buddha and Karl Marx, we really understand in what way Dr. Ambedkar has really dissected the, 
you know the the, the communist uh, philosophy okay so uh, here the question is uh, we speak about love we speak about compassion uh, and uh, we are correlating the justice or the principles of natural justice uh, which is which are flourishing out of this natural love and compassion okay which dr b r ambedkar uh, originates in the buddhist philosophy right so uh, do, do you think considering the ambedkar's philosophy that uh, has ambedkar uh, succeeded in his quest because i know that uh, at the end of his life he was very disturbed uh, and he was quite unhappy with himself as well right Uh, this is what we learn uh, from his uh, writings so uh, considering uh, dr ambedkar's overall life uh, his work as well as his visions for the country and for the common man and as you rightly mentioned that dr ambedkar is a universal figure right it, everybody has something to take from ambedkar so what do you how do you see ambedkar you know as a politician as a statesman as a a political scientist as a lawyer as a social reformer as a really as a, as a, some, someone who's like a moses you know how yeah. how do you see first yeah i mean that, that's something a lot of my colleagues who don't know much of ambedkar but let's say know a lot about john dewey they don't understand you know john dewey was a very important person he met presidents he you know gave gave all these speeches but he wasn't a religious leader he wasn't a politician himself he didn't write the constitution of the united states and so ambedkar had so many roles and his time was divided i don't i do not know how he had the energy to do this uh, and like dewey he wrote so many volumes of works published and unpublished and so he's just a tough thinker a complex thinker and and this is one thing that some people say ah oh, stroud he's more than a pragmatist oh well, of course he was of course he's more than a buddhist Uh, you know he has he's a politician he was a, a author of the constitution in some ways and i mean he was a uh, so he, he, anything you say about him you have to have the caveat that there're going to be other ways to get at it uh, but the important thing i think is to realize that he was energized in all these missions and he never thought he solved any of these problems right i mean that's the i think the only time you worry i've heard this about academics you say the only time you worry about academics are when they're happy uh you know so there's there's kind of a dissatisfaction with uh deep thinkers perhaps like ambedkar and you know he he knew at the end of his life he had not solved all his problems on the other hand you know i'm sure he was satisfied in the in the struggle you know in the struggle forcefully pursued with the certain limits you know so he he was pushing as hard as he could he didn't make everyone his friend but i believe he had a vision of democracy and he, he tried to give this to people and he in some of his speeches he literally said to his followers uh, one speech to mahars he said the books i leave you with will be a guide when i'm gone and this was in the 1930s and so in the 1930s he knew he wasn't going to be around forever but his writings are going to be around for a long time uh, so so this is a fascinating situation we can now kind of access the mind of ambedkar but partially and he's a complex figure so none of us should ever think we could exhaustively capture the mind of ambedkar uh but let's try to find the useful aspects and i think social democracy is one of those things that just so important because india like the us is trying to form a community a shared community and that is tough it is tough to get along with people you think are your enemies it's tough to get along with people who you don't love and you know ambedkar Jesus, you know, do we a lot of these thinkers and religious traditions, uh, you know, the challenge it is to like the people who you don't like <laughs> or love those who don't show you love. So this is a challenge and Ambedkar is part of that tradition and he has this unique way of spelling it out. Well, yeah, I I do agree. I mean, this is something which is unique and Ambedkar has shown that it is possible. You know, he lived what he actually preached. uh well it seems uh, there are no questions uh, coming up from our participants uh, okay so uh, professor I, i would like you to uh, share something about uh, your uh, uh, professor devi uh, research center which you have established in uh, pune university of pune so please tell us something about it yes what is this about and how is it is working functioning how is it Yeah so I, I believe it was about a year and a half or two years ago uh, professor Vijay Kare at uh, Savitrivai Phule Pune University and I started this first center and you know it was on I flew over there and I took in my luggage 
uh, Dewey's collected works, which like Baba Sahib's collected works are a lot of pages, a lot of weight, <laughs> but I didn't want to trust them to the postal service to mail. So uh, I, you know, we carried them over there. And so those books are now being used by students at Pune University because Dewey's works are hard to get a hold of. It's, ex you know, the, the, these editions are expensive. So th this, this set of 38 volumes was donated by the John Dewey Society, a group of uh, mostly American academics. And you know, I hope to start more Dewey centers in India, but the point is twofold. And some of this has been put on hold because of the pandemic. Uh, so you know, first is to enhance the knowledge of John Dewey in India. And that is, uh, you know, cause because like Embedkar in America, I think people in India could benefit from, you know, agreeing with or disagreeing with or thinking about arguing with the ideas of John Dewey. And so getting access to those ideas is the first step. Also programming that might expose uh, Deweyan thinkers to Indian audiences would be uh, good. And like I said, it's been difficult to have events over in India because of the pandemic. And uh, you, you, you can do Zoom events, but a lot of people are, are fatigued on Zoom. So this is something we're going to ramp up in the future. And the second thing would be to encourage more American thinkers involved in Dewey to see Dr. Ambedkar as part of that you know, legacy, a, a very important new part of that legacy, and to, to take his thought seriously and to study it. So, so really that kind of bi-directional influence is what I want to start to do with the establishment of these Dewey centers, to get more Dewey into Indian discussions and more Embedkar into American discussions, and to get scholars and thinkers and just ordinary folks on both sides interested in the other because I think Embedkar and Dewey are both on the same wavelength. They're on the same team and they're both very interested in democracy and its challenges. That's very true. That's very true because uh, see the ideas uh, needs to be propagated. The ideas needs to be studied. Ideas needs to be talked about as well. Otherwise they would die. And we know that very well. Now, uh, see why I'm so happy today, Professor, I'll tell you, because you're talking about John Dewey. Right. Uh, see, my father was the first one who introduced me to John Dewey and uh, John Dewey's writings and uh, his relationship with Dr. Ambedkar. I mean to say the academic as well as serious kind of relationship, right, through, his, through the writing, through the influences. And uh, when, I, when I look at uh, the Ambedkarite scholarships in India, right, uh, my humble submission is that it is very rare to find, you know, uh, that people are working on John Dewey's uh, uh, ideas, I mean, as a research topic, you know, or as a research project. So maybe uh, people like you and those who are interested in John Dewey and bringing Ambedkar and Dewey together, uh, we can really do something, you know, for the people to help them understand uh, Dewey and Ambedkar together and individually, okay, in the most uh, effective way, in the better way, of course, in the interest of the needs of the ever changing democratic settings not only of india not only of america but all over the world right so ambedkar and dewey are truly relevant they are the global figures and uh, need to be they need to be understood in that sense so with these words uh, professor stroud uh, you know i, I really uh, congratulate you for this lecture and i'm really grateful for that because uh, you have taken out your time it's it's morning over there i don't yes. know what exactly the time is <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yes, still, so you took out uh, your time and uh, enlightened us. Maybe we'll, we'll keep on meeting. And uh, I don't know when you are coming back to India, but if you happen to visit, please do visit Nagaland, the, the northeastern part of India. You know, I think uh, yes. it would be really great to invite you in our institution. Uh, you can meet our students and help them understand the ideas and thoughts that shape this world. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, yes, definitely. I, I'd i love to visit Nagaland. And I every time I visit India, a lot of times in Maharashtra, but across India, you know, I, I just learned so much and I meet so many wonderful people. And I just, I, I the one of the worst things in the pandemic for me personally has been not being able to visit my friends in India and worrying about their health in India. And so I, I hope to make new friends like you in Nagaland. <laughs> always. You are always welcome. You're always welcome. I'm always in search of people, you know, uh, who could, uh, I could learn something from them. 
Uh, all right, uh, thank you so much, and thank you all the participants. I, I could see the Insha Mustak is there, Komal Rajak is there, Swati Ugade is there, our Professor Tatankola Ao is there, and many more were participating. They left now, but I'm really thankful to all of them for participating. Thank you so much, yeah. and Professor Trout, have a great morning, have a great day ahead. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, my friends. Jai Beam.